Fetishes are a curious thing. We all have them, of course, though some have more unusual ones than others. Because of that, those with desires that would be considered strange by most often end up feeling the need to hide them from the world. But what happens when those fetishes are discovered, not by a stranger, but by a family member? Someone close who disapproves of what they found? What if that person wants to expose the secret to the world? Everybody reacts differently to their secrets being revealed, but for Mark Redwine, he was willing to stop at nothing to keep his secret, well, a secret. This is Monsters. Mark Allen Redwine was born on August 24, 1961, and though I'm not sure where he was born, he lived most, if not all, of his life in Colorado. During his younger years, he must have had some degree of charm because he was married on two separate occasions. Once to a woman named Betsy Horvath in the late 70s and early 80s, and then again to another woman named Elaine Hatfield in 1989. It's the latter marriage that has the most relevance to what would later take place as it was with Elaine that Mark had two children named Corey and Dylan. While Corey was very near and dear to his father, it was Dylan who seemed to be the apple of his eye. But why wouldn't he be? Because when he was born on February 6th, 1999, it completed the picturesque life the family had in La Plata County, the quiet and rugged area located in the mountains of southwest Colorado. At least that's what it seemed like on the surface, as to anyone who was observing, they were a pretty typical all-American family. With Mark and Elaine still being very much in love at that point, it created a happy environment for the two boys to thrive in. This allowed them to become very close with one another, despite the fact that there was a seven-year age gap between the two. It wasn't uncommon, in fact, for Cody to drive Dylan both to and from sports practices after school, a place where the younger sibling excelled while playing anything he could get the opportunity to, whether that be football, baseball, or even basketball. Whenever there was a big sports game on TV, the pair often had playful bets with each other over the result. Bets that usually amounted to the loser having to do something like the winner's laundry for them. Sure, they didn't necessarily have their dad around 100% of the time, as Mark had to divide things on account of him still having to see his kids from his prior relationship with Betsy, but that was something that was perfectly manageable in the long run. For the first eight years of Dylan's life, things went as perfectly as they could, all up until the point when Mark and Elaine's relationship began to sour. Like with his first marriage, problems started to arise between Mark and his current wife. So much so that by 2007, their life together had become unmanageable. That was why, later that same year, they decided that it was best for everyone involved if they split up and went their separate ways. Of course, they would still have to keep some level of contact with one another, if for no other reason than to raise their children. But that was nothing new to Mark, since he had gone through that already. So while it was painful to separate, he seemed to handle the situation well enough. That was until he realized Elaine was pushing for full custody of then still 13-year-old Dylan, something that came as a huge shock to the boy's father. Why was she pushing for that? Well, as it turned out, things were a lot worse than anyone could have imagined behind closed doors. While to most people it looked like Mark was a good father and that, even if his marriage was falling apart, he was always going to be there for his kids, in reality, his relationship with Dylan and Corey had soured quite drastically over the preceding years. As Corey would later put it, his father could be a cruel and violent man, someone who had deep-seated issues which, rather than dealing with, he often chose to take out on them instead. Dylan would back up those claims when asked as well, with him arguing he didn't get along with his father at all and that because of that he had no interest in seeing him anymore. When the La Plata County Court of Durango was presented with this testimony on September 21st, 2012, it was decided that the best thing to do was award full custody of the youngest Redwind boy to Elaine and her new partner, Mike Hall. 
Mark would still get some kind of access in the form of court-mandated visitations, which would occur on a semi-regular basis that would see Dylan, as the only one who was still a minor, have to travel from his new home in Monument, Colorado, back to where his father remained in nearby Bayfield. Not that he enjoyed these visits, however. No, as far as he was concerned, he'd have been much happier staying in Monument and carrying on with his favorite pastime, sports. That wasn't the only reason he didn't want to go see his father anymore, though, because there was another one that was far more upsetting to him. That had to do with pictures of Mark he and his brother had accidentally uncovered during a prior father-son road trip in the summer of 2012. It was there that, after both Dylan and Corey had agreed to go visit their father and catch up with him, they had borrowed his laptop one night and been met with quite a shock once they logged in. On that computer were a series of graphic photos. Photos that showed their father dressed in a wig and women's lingerie. That wasn't all, though, because he was also pictured eating what appeared to be human feces from a diaper. That's right, Mark Redwine's secret fetish, the one he was too ashamed to tell his family, was that he was a coprophiliac. Basically, a coprophiliac is someone who has an erotic fascination with feces as well as general filth and uncleanliness. While at times this can mean they simply enjoy either watching people defecate on them, or defecating on people themselves, at other times it can also mean a person gets a sexual thrill from either smearing feces on themselves or outright eating it. Obviously then, this is a particularly unusual desire and one that goes a level above more typical stuff like BDSM or cosplay, for example. With the potential risk of infection or illness surrounding the practice, it's no surprise most who participate in it feel the need to hide it as there's likely a certain degree of shame associated with it. And I'm not intending to shame anyone who participates in this type of activity where I think it should be understandable that the general population will find some level of disgust in the thought of consuming or even handling feces. As long as it's something taking place between consenting adults, there's nothing wrong with doing whatever turns you on. Hopefully, the people who do engage in this type of thing are taking some sort of precautions to avoid infection and general illness. Still, it's not the kind of thing which could be easily brought up with a partner as being a potential option in the bedroom. The fact most people would likely recoil at the suggestion of such an act probably contributes towards the reality of coprophiliacs tending to keep their desires more private than most. But how does such a desire arise in the first place? After all, the general scientific belief is that sexual fetishes aren't created in a vacuum. They're usually developed in childhood, right at the point when our brains are first beginning to form properly. While there have been various different suggestions given for this over the years, one of the most prominent seems to come from Sigmund Freud, who argued that coprophilia represents a psychological desire to regress back to childhood. As he put it, defecation plays a key role in the psychosexual development of children, with this initially presenting itself during the anal sadistic phase. A bowel movement can be described as a somewhat pleasurable experience given that it can stimulate the prostate area in men. On top of that, Freud argued a fascination with feces may be connected to genital stimulation that occurs during the changing of diapers during infancy. Because of that, the feeling of being aroused by such a thing can be a subconscious desire to want to return to such a period of infancy. Now it should be made clear that these are only theories and no definitive accepted explanation has ever been given for the cause of either coprophilia or any other sexual fetish. In fact, when it comes to Freud in particular, many psychologists now feel his research on such topics is flawed at best. That said, there are others who continue to feel he is right in his assumptions, meaning it's all a matter of which side you fall on. Regardless of which one you believe, it's not to suggest there's necessarily a right or wrong answer. I'm simply trying to provide some possible context as to what made Mark Redwine the man he was. It's also not to suggest that those who identify as coprophiliacs are all killers. What led to the death of a child here was clearly a whole separate issue. Basically, it seems like what Mark did boiled down to the deep-rooted sense of shame he suffered from, and a desire to make sure no one else found out about his shame, no matter the cost. This now concludes our discussion on fecal matter. After seeing the shocking images they discovered on Mark's computer, Dylan and Corey struggled to figure out what to do next. 
Should they confront their father and ask what he had been doing, or should they just pretend they never saw it and all move on with their lives instead? While the latter option would arguably be preferable, it would also be difficult because, in Corey's own words, he found the photos to be disgusting. Of course, it wasn't just the content of them which upset the boy, though. No, it was the fact they now felt like they didn't even know who their father was anymore. After all, if he was able to keep a secret like this from them, then who knew what else he was hiding? Maybe there were all sorts of things they hadn't yet learned about their father. Things that would upset them even more if they were discovered. Really, the only way to deal with the situation was to get everything out in the open. At least initially, the pair felt it was best to say nothing for the time being, as the moment wasn't quite right yet. So that was why they finished up the road trip and then returned home, safe in the knowledge they could now go back to their regular lives for a while. That said, as they soon discovered, going back to normality was no longer a possibility. Not after they'd seen what they had seen. And especially not after the courts had mandated they go back to visit their father semi-regularly after that. Without knowing what else to do, the boys decided they would rip the band-aid off before things got any worse and tell their father they knew about his secret. Corey finally did tell Mark what he knew when, during a text argument with him not long after, he sent him a message which read, quote, Hey beautiful, you are what you eat, look in the mirror. Now obviously, this wasn't an outright confirmation they had seen the photos in question, but Mark had to be savvy enough to understand what the statement implied. Given how hard he had worked to keep this side of himself private up until then, it must have come as quite a shock. Realizing everyone was going to find out soon enough if he didn't do something to stop it, he set about creating a plan that would soon see him go down in infamy. Meanwhile, as he was doing that, Dylan and Corey were coming up with a plan of their own that would lead to at least one of them confronting their father in person and forcing him to give them an explanation of his actions. But how were they going to pull that off? After all, if the only two people who'd seen the compromising photos up until then were his sons, then what was to stop Mark from simply denying they ever existed? Well, while they may have been disgusted by the content they found on their father's computer that fateful day, the pair were at least aware enough to know they should download copies of them in case such a situation occurred in the future. Now, Corey had each and every one of the incriminating images saved to his cell phone. So when Thanksgiving came along in November of 2012, and Dylan's first court-mandated visit to Mark was arranged for that weekend, the younger sibling asked his brother to send him the photo so he could bring them with him. Of course, he knew as soon as he revealed that he had them, it was likely not going to go down well. And maybe that was why he had initially tried to get out of going back to Bayfield at all. In the days prior to his flight, Dylan had begged his mother to let him stay home instead, something she was unable to do as it would have violated the court's ruling. With that not working, Dylan next attempted to set up sleeping arrangements with friends in the area so that he wouldn't have to stay with his father overnight. Unfortunately though, once Mark found out about the plan, he vetoed the idea because as far as he was concerned, this was his time with his son. On top of that, he was already aware his kids knew about his fetish and he didn't want to risk any more people finding out about it before he could talk to them directly. So despite his pleas on November 18th of that year, Dylan took a flight from Colorado Springs to Durango where he would be met by his father and from there taken back to his home to stay for the next few days. In this instance though, Corey would not be joining him because, with him being 20 years old, there was no legal mandate to make him do so anymore. No, the older sibling would instead stay home with his mother and stepfather and celebrate the holiday in a more peaceful manner. Sure, he knew it wasn't going to be a lot of fun for his brother to visit their father alone, but he had faith things would work out for the best in the long run after he confronted him. What he didn't realize at the time, though, was that, rather than seeing Dylan again in a few days, he'd never have any contact with him again. That was because, after arriving at the Durango airport at 5.46 p.m., the tension quickly became palpable. After all, both father and son were now well aware the other knew about the underlying situation. It was just a case of who was going to bring it up first. And while it's unclear exactly when this conversation did take place, something we do know is that it didn't happen when they first came together that day. As can be seen in airport surveillance footage, the two were seen walking outside together, apparently under civil terms. 
and when further surveillance footage captured them at a Walmart almost two hours later at 7.05 p.m., the atmosphere between the two appeared to be similar. The boy's text messages to his mother at that point didn't paint as rosy a picture as, when she asked him if he had met his father okay not long after he had landed, Dylan replied with a message which said he had and then included a frowny face emoji after it. But why would he say anything different? After all, the last place he wanted to be at that moment in time was around his father. All he wanted to do instead was get the whole thing over with as quickly as possible, preferably while spending as much time as he could with friends in the area. On his first night there, in fact, he even made plans to go see an old schoolmate named Ryan. But when Mark heard about the plans, he told his son he'd have to cancel them, as instead they were going out to a restaurant for dinner together. That only increased the unspoken tension between the pair. No longer wanting to be seen in public with the man who had taken the photos which were now burned into his brain, Dylan told him he'd rather just go to a McDonald's drive through Perhaps not wanting to antagonize him any further, Mark agreed to that, though first he would make sure his son sent a text to his friend to tell him he wouldn't be showing up. Something which Dylan did, albeit not before making plans to see Ryan the following morning at 6.30am instead. Of course, he'd never make it to that meeting because by then he'd be missing. However, that wouldn't be the last contact he had with anyone because as late as 9.37pm that evening, he was still texting his mother back and forth. After that, though, the trail went cold. Neither family nor friends would receive any further correspondence from the teenager. That obviously concerned his friend Ryan as it meant he never showed up the following morning. The next time any news about Dylan came at all, it was 5pm on November 19th, as it was then that Mark went to the local Bayfield Marshal's office to let them know he'd been able to find his son all day. As he described it then, that morning at around 7.30 a.m., he'd tried to wake Dylan up to get him to go run errands with him, but Dylan had refused and said he instead wanted to stay in bed. So leaving him be, Mark went to both his work payroll office and his divorce attorney's office, two visits which were later confirmed to have taken place by the investigators. Mark then returned home at 11.30 a.m. to find Dylan gone, but it wasn't just him that was missing. No, all of Dylan's belongings had been taken as well. Apparently not too concerned about the fact that his youngest child was nowhere to be seen, Mark claimed that he took a nap and didn't wake up again until around 2.30 p.m. Now, for most people, going to sleep under these circumstances would seem baffling, but then the relationship between the pair had already disintegrated so much by then that it was feasible for an outsider to believe Mark assumed Dylan had gone to let off some steam by seeing his friend for a few hours. When 2.30 came and went and the boy was still AWOL, however, his father said he began to worry. That was why, about a half an hour later, he went around the area visiting known friends of Dylan's in hopes that somebody had seen him. No matter how many doors he knocked on, no one could give Mark any information regarding the boy's whereabouts. In fact, when he went to see the friend Dylan was supposed to meet that morning, the supposedly concerned father was told by Ryan that he had been trying to contact his son all day but ultimately had not been able to do so. With no other options left, at around 5 p.m., Mark finally spoke to the authorities and expressed his concerns. Strangely, though, he did not file a missing persons report. On top of that, it wasn't until later in the evening that he contacted Dylan's mother Elaine to explain to her what was happening. Of course, once Elaine heard the news, she had a much different reaction than her ex-husband's more blasé attitude as she immediately got off the phone and called the La Plata County Sheriff's Office to report her child missing. After that, she, Mike, and Corey all got in their car and started driving towards Durango, a drive which would take them around five and a half hours. Obviously, once they arrived, there was no time to waste, and so over the next couple of days, a massive search and rescue operation was carried out in conjunction with not only the police, but also members of the local community who had since been made aware of what had happened. It wasn't just the local community who were getting the word out, though, because pretty quickly news of Dylan's disappearance reached a national level, meaning it would be talked about on a variety of shows such as Nancy Grace and the Investigation Discovery Channel. On top of that, law enforcement would receive several tips from psychics over the next few weeks, each of whom claimed to know what had happened to the young boy and where he could be found. 
Unfortunately, though, despite the hope being that Dylan had merely run away from home, as the days went on and there was still no sign of him, authorities began to fear the worst. That feeling was only added to by the strange behavior of Mark. Behavior that included him not only neglecting to join in on the search for his son, but also refusing to even come out of his house to speak to coordinators. Sure, you can make an argument that he was grieving, and people often grieve in strange ways, but the idea that a father wouldn't want to do anything he could to save his child seemed baffling to those on the scene. He also seemed insistent that the search, the one he refused to participate in, focus on a large lake about seven miles from his home rather than the forest nearby. It was also noticed that he repeatedly spoke of Dylan in the past tense during a community-led vigil, something that was thought to be odd to say the least. That was why, when Mark's first wife spoke to investigators soon after and gave them some disturbing information, it led to all eyes starting to look at him as a suspect. According to Betsy Horvath, Mark had told her years prior that if he ever had to get rid of a body, the place to hide it would be out in the mountains. Then, as if that wasn't enough, she also relayed a conversation that took place between them during their divorce when he had said he would kill the kids before he'd ever let her have them. And Betsy wasn't the only one who had concerns about her ex-husband either. No, as soon as Elaine arrived in La Plata County, both she and her husband felt confident Mark knew more than he was letting on. What else were they supposed to think when they learned that, while being questioned by investigators, he had immediately tried to implicate her in the disappearance? As he put it, quote, Obviously it's no secret that I believe Elaine could be involved in this. I don't know how she would do it, I don't know who else she'd have involved with it, but I can't help but think there's a possibility that she had some involvement. Thankfully, the police didn't buy this explanation. It was actually quite the opposite, in fact, because, as a result of gathering evidence against him, they too began to suspect Mark. So that was why, after releasing an official statement on November 28th saying that Dylan Redwine was not being considered a runaway, they searched Mark's house the following afternoon using cadaver dogs. Even if those dogs quickly alerted to the scent of possible human remains that had recently been inside the house, and the blood of Dylan was discovered in numerous spots in both the living room and the back of Mark's pickup truck, it wasn't considered evidence enough to arrest him since the amounts were just too small. It was legally circumstantial. Mark had even offered what was at the time considered a plausible explanation for the blood when he said that on the night of the 18th after the two had gotten home, they had engaged in some roughhousing. As to what had ultimately become of his son after that, though, well, Mark now changed his stance by arguing Dylan had probably gone hiking and, in the process of doing so, had been accidentally shot by a hunter. That seems oddly specific. Of course, the idea that Dylan took all of his belongings and went hiking only to be accidentally shot was a completely ridiculous theory. Mark was clearly planting the seeds that his child was already dead, which was exactly why Elaine outright accused her ex-husband of being involved at that point. In order to try and calm the situation down and get some more concrete information, each party agreed to take a lie detector test. Unfortunately for Mark, though, the test did not go well for him because while Elaine and her husband Mike passed it with flying colors, he failed miserably, particularly when it came to the question, quote, Do you know where Dylan is? Do you know where Dylan is? Failed. Right. Because I believe that his mom has something to do with this. What's that have to do with do you know where Dylan because is? Because the way I interpreted the question, do I know where he's at? I don't know where he's at specifically, but and I know that mom has everything. You that question, don't you think? Well, do you know where Dylan is? I don't know where he's at. I think I know where he's at. That was that was how I interpreted the question. I know, you know, it doesn't, it it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me either. Are you currently That's why hiding here. any knowledge? Of Dylan's location. Mm, absolutely not. But you failed that. Well, the way it was explained to me, the ones that I was having a problem with was the, you know, did I see him after Monday morning, and did I know where he was at? Are you currently hiding any knowledge of Dylan's location? Absolutely not. And you failed? Absolutely not. I have no clue where that boy's at. I think I know where he's at, and I think he's with his mom. I have no doubt that somehow she's got her fingers tied to this. 
What's that have to do with, are you currently hiding any knowledge of Dylan's location? I guess I didn't understand the question I was being asked. I gotta tell you, dude, as you can imagine, in my line of work, and I've been sure doing this for 20 sure. years, I look at a lot of fucking liars. I see a lot of fucking yeah, liars. Fine. Dude, this is your son. I understand that. There's like a hundred fucking people I out there understand looking for you right all now, of that. And you're you not, failed to polygraph. You're not telling me anything I don't already know. Now, I always point out that polygraph tests are notoriously unreliable, and so failing it doesn't necessarily mean anything in itself. Them being easily manipulated or affected by things such as nerves is the reason they aren't admissible in court. But with there already being so much evidence pointing in Mark's direction, it wouldn't be a great leap to say police considered him a person of interest at that point, even if he wasn't an official suspect. The only question was, would anyone be able to prove his involvement and, in the process, allow the authorities to formally charge him? In order to do that, what they needed was a smoking gun, something that would serve as undeniable proof that this man hurt his own son. They got one step closer to finding that proof when Corey informed the investigation team about the photos he had of his father saved on his phone. For as guilty as that made Mark look, it still wasn't proof enough that he'd been involved in the possible death of his own flesh and blood. While people close to the case now feared he had done something truly unforgivable, as far as the law was concerned, he was a free man. Free enough to join Elaine and Corey on an episode of the Dr. Phil show in February of 2013 where they discussed the case in front of a nationwide audience of millions. On the show, things would get particularly awkward when Mark was confronted with the now infamous photos of him that had spread online for all to see. As he argued, though, there was nothing real about those images. He claimed that they were clearly photoshopped and just another way to make him look guilty over something he hadn't done. Of course, few watching believed that to be true, and Mark was only made to look even guiltier when Dr. Phil asked each party to take a polygraph in order to find out if they knew where Dylan was, and he outright refused to participate. Soon after, Elaine questioned why he would refuse to take the test if he was truly incident. Well, the answer to that was obvious. He'd already failed one, and he didn't want to fail a second one on television, especially as it would further implicate him in what was now looking increasingly like a murder case. It was likely that Elaine was unaware that Mark had failed the first test, though. Even when authorities questioned him again after the TV interview, giving him several opportunities to admit what he had done, he repeatedly denied knowing anything or that he had done a single thing wrong at all. It was beginning to feel like no further movement would ever be made in Dylan's case. That was until a breakthrough was finally reached on June 27, 2013, when the partial remains of a young boy wearing the same clothes Dylan had on in the Walmart security footage were discovered on Middle Mountain Road, roughly 100 yards off of an AV trail and about 8 miles or 13 kilometers away from Mark's house. What made that location even more damning for the prime suspect was that, just a couple of months prior, he'd been seen by Elaine's husband, Mike, driving alone around that area, all before leaving town for good. That's right, in April of 2013, the father of four had fled town, something that was seen as highly strange at the time, but also something the investigators were powerless to stop as he still hadn't been formally charged. Of course, now with the discovery of his son's remains in one of the last known locations he'd been seen in the area, it only made them wish they'd charged him while they had the chance. Even that wasn't the only thing that made police want to bring Mark in for additional questioning, though, as, after the corpse was discovered, he reportedly told his older son Corey during a rare phone conversation that the rest of Dylan's body, including his skull, would have to be found before investigators could determine if blunt force trauma was the cause of death. Despite his refusal to return to La Plata County to speak to investigators, Mark still wouldn't be named a formal suspect in what was now very clearly a murder. That wouldn't happen until a full two years later, and not before a second search was carried out on his home where cadaver dogs once again identified the scent of a possible dead body that had been there previously. 
even if he was now an official suspect and more than likely the man who committed the crime. He was still right about one thing, and that was that the police needed to find the skull in order to fully ascertain a cause of death. So, it's just as well it was finally unearthed by two hikers in November of 2015, approximately one mile or 1.6 kilometers from the location where the rest of the body had been discovered two and a half years earlier. It was at that point, and only at that point, that after confirming blunt force trauma had indeed occurred, and that it was highly unlikely that an animal was responsible for the skull being so far apart from the rest of Dylan's remains, that the case was officially deemed to be a homicide investigation. But even after that, Mark still wouldn't be arrested for another two years as it took that long for police to build a concrete enough case against him to where they felt comfortable putting him on trial. Once they had that, though, and once a new district attorney was elected, someone who'd been working on the Dylan Redwine case for a while by then, a formal arrest would be approved. On July 22, 2017, at the father's new home in Bellingham, Washington, Mark was arrested and charged with both second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. Finally, after all that time, justice seemed to be near for Dylan. It was something that his family were overjoyed to hear, as having to watch Mark roam around as a free man for the past 24 months, despite it being clear to them he'd committed the murder, was enough to drive them near insane. That mindset hadn't helped by the fact they were still grieving themselves, constantly seeking a closure which couldn't come until the killer was caught. Now that he was being held in La Plata County Jail after having been extradited back to Colorado, they could begin preparing themselves for the upcoming trial where it seemed obvious to everyone involved what the end result would be. Not that Mark wouldn't be putting up a fight, however. No, he would continue to protest his innocence even then. And when he wasn't doing that, he was helping his legal team to consistently push back the trial date as happened once in November of 2018, a second time in September of 2019 when his attorney was arrested for assault and domestic violence, of course, and then a third time in April of 2020 as a result of the pandemic. As that was going on, the mother of his son, Elaine, was simultaneously making sure the story remained in the public eye by pushing the Justice for Dylan Redwine movement a grassroots campaign which, amongst other things, fought to get a new law passed in the state of Colorado which upgraded abuse of a corpse charges from misdemeanors to third-degree felonies. Elaine believed that Mark had moved their son's remains after he had died, likely because he felt it was at greater risk of being found where it was. If that was indeed the case and he was found guilty of such an act, it would mean even if he wasn't convicted of the murder itself, he would still see prison time. That proved to be a smart decision on her part because, by the time the trial actually began in June of 2021, the prosecution were unable to push for first-degree murder as they were simply unable to find any evidence of there being premeditated planning involved. Still, there was plenty of evidence to suggest Mark had killed Dylan regardless. Evidence that included the suspicious nature of his behavior immediately after the disappearance, his damning appearance on Dr. Phil, and the traces of blood found all throughout his home. Sure, there was only minimal blood discovered at the scene, far less than the average person would expect to find following blunt force trauma to the head, but as a forensic expert at the trial would state upon cross-examination, while blunt force injuries could easily result in death, they may leave behind very little actual blood, if any at all. Then, of course, there were also the photos showing Mark engaging in his secret sexual fetish. As far as the prosecutors were concerned, this showed a very clear motive as to why he would do what he did, because, with him no doubt being scared such images would become known to the rest of his family and friends, he had every reason to kill his son in order to keep that quiet. To the prosecution, this was an open and shut case, especially as additional testimony later heard from Mark's neighbors would describe his inconsistent and unusual behavior in the days immediately following the crime but he was prepared for that attack on his character. Or at least his legal team was, because when they had a chance to present their side of the story, they pushed the idea that it was impossible for the accused to get a fair trial as everyone had been prejudiced against him from the start. Elaine had been publicly claiming that he had killed Dylan for years now, and as a result of both that and the massive media attention the case had gotten, most automatically assumed it was the reality of the situation. 
The defense even presented numerous Facebook pages the grieving mother had made, each of which called for her ex-husband's arrest, as evidence that she had a vendetta against him, and that it was this vendetta which led to public sentiment turning on the suspected killer early on. When it came to the physical evidence, such as the damage to the boy's skull, well, that wasn't as clear-cut as it seemed, according to the defense. As per the testimony of an expert witness they brought to the stand, there was no way of saying for certain exactly when the fracture to Dylan's skull had occurred. On top of that, the fact that the skull was found separate from the rest of the body was not particularly unusual as there was always still the possibility animals had carried it away post-mortem, and that last point was particularly important to the case as they were now arguing that, if the damage had indeed happened to Dylan's head on or around the time of his death, then the culprits could very well have been local animals. As a forensic anthropologist who'd been called to the Standwood State, there were tons of mountain lions, bears, and coyotes in the area where the remains were discovered, and those couldn't be ruled out as being the ones who had killed him. Clearly then, based on what was taking place, the play was not to provide a concrete alternative explanation as to how Dylan had died, but instead to provide enough reasonable doubt as to whether or not Mark himself had been the killer. Maybe that was why he never actually took the stand himself, as it was probably likelier he'd get caught in a lie if he did so. This hurt him more in the end, as it was later commented by many at the trial that, even after seeing photos of his son, he barely reacted at all, and he never once cried. Unfortunately for Mark, that combined with all of the other evidence against him was eventually enough to seal his fate. After six hours of deliberation, the jury returned with guilty verdicts on both the charges of second-degree murder and child abuse. Mark maintained that he was innocent of all charges and that the conviction was a fake. As far as he was concerned, in fact, what had taken place in that courtroom was nothing more than a miscarriage of justice and a sham trial intended to unfairly crucify him for something he hadn't done. Chief Judge Jeffrey Wilson saw things differently, however, and it was something he would state in his closing comments to the newly convicted. As he put it, quote, First of all, you killed your son, a 13-year-old boy. At 13, he's still a boy. As the father, it's your obligation to protect your son, keep him from harm. Instead of that, you inflicted enough injury on him to kill him in your living room. After the passion of whatever caused you to act the way you did subsided, you didn't think about Dylan. You thought about yourself. You sanitized the crime scene. You hid Dylan's body and you went so far as to remove his head from the rest of his body. Once that had been stated for the record, Judge Wilson went a step further by handing down his sentence. Again, in his own words, quote, the community needs to be protected from you. You need to be removed from society for a very long period of time. I'm going to sentence you to 48 years on both counts, with five years of parole, which will be served concurrently. You'll receive 1,540 days of credit for time served. 48 years is a long time for a man who was by this point already in middle age. In fact, it's entirely possible that the killer father would never see freedom again. Sure, he would file an appeal against his conviction in November of 2021, with him citing the same reasons there as he had upon being sentenced. But as of the time of this recording, it's impossible to say what the result of his appeal will be. It seems highly unlikely it could possibly end in anything close to an early release. The evidence is just too strong for there to be any reasonable doubt about what Mark did. That's why Elaine is only too happy to see him remain in prison for the rest of his natural life. As she would state when interviewed after the result of the trial had been delivered, quote, It's justice as far as justice can go. There will never be enough time for taking Dylan's life. But at least he hopefully won't get out. Hopefully he'll die in prison. Even now, over a decade later, she still struggles with the reality that her son is gone forever. Particularly whenever the anniversary of his death comes around in November. She has kept as strong as possible, if for no other reason than because she still has another son to think of. But she needn't worry too much about him, because as far as Corey is concerned, while he's still grieving over his brother and likely always will be, he has managed to move on with his life to the point he now works for the Department of Human Services in Cannon City. There he plays a pivotal role in advocating for children in need, something he does in honor of Dylan. 
On top of that, he's also built a family of his own as he and his high school sweetheart are married now and have two young children together. While caring for them takes up the majority of his days, he still can't help but occasionally think about where his younger sibling might be today if he was still alive. By all accounts, he was a kid loved by those who knew him and one who had a bright future ahead. So it's just unfortunate that fate would lead him to stumble upon some hidden photos of his father one day as, in the end, it was a moment that sealed his fate. Still, even if a child like that has now been lost from the world, his goal of confronting his father and exposing his secret has been achieved in the long run. In perhaps the greatest irony of all, despite killing his son in order to keep his private photos secure, the subsequent trial would see these be leaked out to the internet anyway, freely available for all to see. While that ultimately makes the death of his son even more pointless, there is a certain sense of satisfaction that can be taken knowing that Mark Redwine didn't get what he wanted, and that his biggest punishment will now be being forced to live with the fact that everyone knows who he truly is. Not just a man with a secret, but also a cold-blooded monster. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.